welcome to another episode of the What Goes On podcast. This week we are joined by the rather magnificent Mr. Dave Gregory, best known for being the guitarist in XTC. And um, hi, Dave. Hello, How's Matt. It's lovely to, to see you, fa- meet you face to face after having corresponded, uh, but via the Royal Mail and you fixing up my guitars fantastically, I might say. I'm not <laughs> Thank you. That's I'm not I being obsequious. I, I generally have a lot of uh, a, a huge amount of respect for your talent, and uh, you've done some great work for me. So I thank you. I get that out of the way here. Well, that's 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 good. And as we're on that um, that front, um, thanks for all your guitar playing, which is like off the charts. It's amazing. I've always wow. been a really big fan of the way you you play. I kind of found I kind of stumbled into uh, you, you as a guitarist, but actually via by a blur because I'm a big like Graham Coxon fan and I think you and him kind of you've got a very similar style it's yeah. not a traditional mm. you know blues rocky you know whatever there's it's you've got your own thing and you hear it you hear it instantly and you're just like I know that who that is you know and, um it's really I found it really inspirational in a way it's kind of the guitarist I I would like to be so so thank you <laughs> <laughs> well, that's great, Matt, but I should point out that in, certainly where XTC is concerned, there was another very good guitar, well, there was a very good guitarist in Andy Partridge. Mm. Oh, he yeah. has a very individual style and he's brilliant at it. It's much more ry- rhythmic and uh, edgy and spiky. It's a lot more, I tend to be the more, um, my playing isn't as, uh, it isn't quite as aggressive as his. Mm. He has a sound that's uh, very much Andy. It hasn't really changed very much over the last 40 years, but it's fine because he, he's great at what he does. So quite often people confuse the two of us, and I'm often credited with his solos and vice versa. Uh, it's a bit annoying sometimes, but it worked. And like you say, with Graham Cox and similar lineup with the band, um, you've got uh, – actually, no, I'm not sure if um, – if Damon played guitar, he may have done, I'm not sure. But certainly Graham, uh, I know, is a big fan of XTC, and he's worked with Andy, or Andy had worked with Blur on the, a few tracks that probably it wasn't, didn't, didn't turn out as well as everyone had hoped it would. But uh, there are similarities, and uh, well, I'm flattered by the comparison. <laughs> is I, I have to pick up on that similarity between Graham Coxon and yourself, and also, now that I'm thinking about it, or as I was thinking about it before you talked about Andy's guitar playing, there seems to be, a, and this may be completely moot now because you've just said that lots of the parts which are um, ascribed to you are actually Andy's and vice versa, but it seems like there's almost uh, a spirit of Jimi Hendrix in both of you. Because he wasn't a straight ahead kind of rocky, well, he was right at the beginning of, of all of that stuff, but it's not it's not standard stuff. It, it's quite intricate and melodic and the way that he used chords and things like that. I, I feel that comes through in your playing and and also Graham's. Is it? Would you say that was the case? Well, I, certainly. I, Hendrix is still my favourite guitar player of all time, but the possible exception of Jeff Beck. He's uh, those mm. those two guys really, mm. uh, and Eric Clapton as well. Just a, a stunning talent, all of mm. them. But the fact is, the guitar parts were always worked out. We didn't improvise very much. Occasionally on mm. stage, when on you know back in the days when the band was playing live, there would be a few wig outs. Uh, on a couple of songs, but most of the stuff was rehearsed down to the last detail before we went into the studio. And Andy was always dead against guitar players, you know, just indulging themselves and not really doing much with the time they, they, they were taking up on the record. So if there was a solo in a song, it was there for a purpose. And he taught me, because when I joined the band, you know, I'd been playing like most people, R&B and blues and stuff and uh, a lot of this traditional British rock stuff that was going around in the 70s. When I got into the band, it, he drew my ear towards melody and mm-hmm. there was this unwritten law that if you take a solo, write something mentally, come up with some melodies or some, some hooks, 
don't just you know play all the cliches and um, and dick around for for 30 seconds or however long you're allowed <laughs> uh, <laughs> figure out something that will work with the song and always remember the melody and that's true of most of the songs that he wrote and his attitude towards music. The same with Colin Moulding, great ear for melody for a bass player. And you listen to his uh, bass parts, they're always, they never take the obvious route. There's always a melody there, but you have to, you have to look for it. Yeah, yeah. But I think that's the essence of XTC and probably um, it did, it certainly opened my ears to a different way of thinking about well, just thinking about what I was doing rather than just following my instincts and being lazy. It's yeah, there's a, there's a lot to that, isn't there? Because when when you are used to playing an instrument, you fall into patterns. You will inevitably do unless you consciously drag yourself away from that. And trying to come up with a melody in your head where you're not constrained by muscle memory and you, how conversant you are with it that's suddenly that you're moving it into a different space and you're thinking about what else is going on rather than what you're able to play which doesn't sound terrible with everything else so that's a yeah that's an interesting uh, interesting way of thinking about it could can you pinpoint a time in your childhood where you where you were first really aware of the excitement that was that welled up in you when you heard something or yeah, the the first inspiration from music, I suppose. For music, well, the house I grew up in with my my uh, mum and dad and two brothers. My mum and dad were fans of music, not pop music. Uh, they loved classical music, mm. and um, so the house was always there was always some some music going on in the house when we were from you know when we were quite small, mm. and uh, then. Mum and Dad decided that uh, you know I I got this I could I could hum along tunes and stuff when I was quite small and that I would be uh, you know probably need to take piano lessons so they got a piano and I was sent off for the piano lessons at around about the age of nine and I was you know forced to practice half an hour every day and it wasn't really uh, I was sort of getting into you have to remember this was the late this was the early sixties. I was nine years old, and um, and then in September 1962, or the autumn of 1962, and I was just past the age of 10, the Beatles arrived. Yeah. And that just, uh, I just got magnetised to this amazing new sound I, I was hearing. I, it, we, we were allowed to have the radio on occasionally, the parents went out and everything. Mm -hmm. So what little music you'd hear from the BBC in those days... There was quite a lot of Beatle music. Once a week, it was pick of the pops on a Sunday afternoon. You'd hear the charts. Uh, this guy called David Jacobs used to present it. And uh, it was the top 20. And we used to be glued to that every Sunday. Find out what had entered the charts that week. But the Beatles were always there. <laughs> yeah. that, that, that really, that was straight away. That I was just... I want to do this. How do I do it? I, I don't play guitar. I don't sing. I can't. It, just, it was just a phenomenal. It was phenomenal. It's difficult to describe how powerful the whole thing, because the, the entire country was taken up with it, you know, whether mm. you uh, liked pop music or not. Uh, it wasn't just the music they were making, but the fashions changed, their attitude. They were just, they were just brilliant at everything. <laughs> Mm -hmm. and uh, you wanted to be like them so um but even before that i can remember uh, primary school i must have been about seven or eight years old some chap brought in a spanish guitar to sh he just brought it into school yeah. and i just it, i was again glued to it i had no idea what's that what is that can you play it he couldn't play it you've been <laughs> given it for a birthday present or something but he i just remember still remember very clearly watching him carrying this thing through the corridor at junior school and, and being intrigued did anyone make any noise with it or was it just a kind of object of interest it was just an object of interest simple as that and yet for some reason i was uh, i was hooked up I, I just thought i i, I I want to find out what that is and what it does. It was a tiny student Spanish guitar, mm. nothing fancy. It wasn't electric. It was just a piece of 
shape of wood with a neck sticking out and some strings on it. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so I suppose that the, the that basic instinct was there from from very very early age. But where it came from, because none of my my parents never played guitar. My mm. dad played piano. My mum played a little bit of piano, uh, but they weren't professional musicians by any means. They just had a love of music, you know. And I think that's that's kind of contagious, and and you can't under you can't overstate the importance of having music around when you're young i think i don't know I, I guess it's probably true my the only way that my parents could get me to sleep when i was a kid was by playing music and so they had reel to reel tape machines or a, a reel to reel tape machine which they put under my cot <laughs> and i don't know whether it was nature or nurture whether you know what, did i go to sleep because i was hearing music or was it the music that was it the music which kind of gave me a love for it and whatever you know it's, it's probably sympathetic but um that i think the early exposure is is the thing which is um which is very interesting not to say that there aren't other influences and there may be genetic stuff and all that kind of stuff but um yeah it's the early exposure seems to be important about the soporific effect of music, because of course, mm. uh, small children quite often have these soft toys with wind up um, uh, yeah. musical boxes inside them that they cuddle when they go to bed, and that'll uh, that'll usually send them off to sleep. I remember my my little brother; he's not so little now, but <laughs> when he was very <laughs> tiny, he had this little fluffy thing that played um, Brahms uh, Brahms melody. Ding 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 ding. Yeah, and that was. Um, that but every time I hear that melody, it takes me back to Bob in his cot. It's very music is incredibly powerful that way, isn't it? It's a bit like smells. Mm. You know, you you smell something and it can take you back to a moment in time which may be decades ago. And likewise, music, you know, that the Brahms lullaby or whatever it's called, takes you right back to that. And I, it kind of almost enters our soul without us wanting or knowing about it doesn't it yeah without being aware of it it just mm. uh, it exists and it, it filters through to the brain and um and it's a soothing thing you know it's a place of comfort mm. uh that's probably the biggest part of it. I, it yeah it's a mysterious thing music but god damn it works <laughs> <laughs> so we've we've had the the object of interest at school and we've had the 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 piano lessons which clearly didn't were not quite what you were wanting you know what you not what you were searching after so how did you get from listening to the Beatles into okay I want to make noise like that how did you what was your path from there onwards well I um I kept badgering my parents for a guitar for my hmm. birthday or for Christmas I said look Ma, I did you're not having a guitar. It's too expensive. Blah blah blah. I mean, you have to remember they, they was they were expensive to buy, mm. and that we didn't have any money. Not in the early '60s. Nobody really. In that whole post-war period, there wasn't a lot of money in people's pockets. Not spending cash. Mm. And my parents, you know, my dad, he just worked at the railways uh, as a clerk, and he had a wife and two kids to bring up. Three kids, in fact, to feed and a mortgage to pay. You know, we weren't treated. So even though I kind of resented the fact that they <laughs> wouldn't wouldn't help me out with this uh, with this uh, with this wish list, uh, I can see quite clearly now today why that was. Mm. So years went by, and they said, "Well, if you want a guitar, you're going to have to pay for it yourself. You know, you have to get a weekend job, pay per round." So that was basically how it started. I'd get in the school holidays, um, got a paper round. And then I was getting a little bit of pocket money. Eventually, I'd saved up enough money to put a deposit on a guitar. But it wasn't until I was 14 years old. So a wow. number of years by. From the age of, uh, I remember it now, it was December 1966. And my parents, there's a little shop in Swindon, Kemp's Music Shop. I'll give him a plug, old Jeff, because he's still there. The music shop is still where it's always been on Commercial Road in Swindon. And Jeff has been its proprietor all these years. And he's a very nice man. And uh, 
he he used to have all the guitars were they used to sell records on the ground floor and then up the stairs it was this magical guitar heaven <laughs> all these guitars around the wall and uh, amplifiers on the floor polished lino there was always this beautiful smell of of, of uh, new lacquer and furniture polish that's like you say the old factory thing that you would mention mm. earlier that if I ever smell that smell again, and I, I don't don't think I ever have since since the shop was revamped. But it, it, you know, as soon as you walked up there, you know, you wanted to stay there, <laughs> yes, yeah. and amid all this opulent uh, musical equipment. And so, I I I'd, I'd sort of worked out a budget. I think I could spend about fifteen pounds on higher purchase. That was as much as I could afford to spend. Mm. And, and I found this uh, Rossetti guitar. Uh, which was a, it was actually, I, I did some research recently because I'd never seen one since since I, since I bought this thing. Drag, anyway, I dragged my parents along to Kempster's music shop, signed the HP forms, and I was I had to pay, find one pound and two shillings a month over the course of a year to pay off this higher purchase loan. And I think perhaps looking back, my, my parents were, it was an education for me to learn how to manage money mm. rather than just, you know, treat me to something and say, right, here you are, don't ask for anything else. You've got to learn how to pay for stuff. Yeah. And so that was uh, that was how it all started. Um, this guitar was, um, it was secondhand. It wasn't very old, only a couple of years old, but it had three pickups, a tremolo arm, and a, a switch that made all kinds of different sounds. I didn't quite know how it how it worked, but the action was, you know, like, <laughs> cheese grater. <laughs> yeah, it was, and the neck was a huge, like baseball bat thing. But it didn't matter. I mean, it was an electric guitar. But of course, I didn't have an amplifier. That would have to come later. <laughs> um, the same thing happened. You know, I think I spent. I, I, I paid it off within nine months, and as soon as I'd paid it off, I said, Dad, I need an amplifier now. Well, you're not putting it on. You're not going to switch it on in this house, boy. Um, uh, where are you going to use that? Well, you know, we've got this band going and blah, blah, blah. So, again, dragged up to Kempster's, signed the forms, got this little wedge front Watkins Dominator. Oh, I think, nice. it was, uh, I think that cost me 16 guineas. Whereas today, if you can find one in good condition, I see they're going for, you know, hundreds, not, if not thousands of pounds. Mm. Mm. Uh, it, it was uh, it was a sweet sounding little thing, but it didn't last very long. I don't know. I did something. I must, I, all of my equipment back then was trashed. <laughs> I didn't know how to look after it. I just wanted to, you know, make the noise. Mm. So, and did, did you have any lessons on guitar or was it kind of going by a... I, did they have any music books where you could learn contemporary songs? Not really. A book of chords. That was the most important thing. Mm. Plus, going back to the piano lessons, that taught yeah. me how to read notation. And I learned a lot of music theory as a result of that. How many years did you do the piano for? About five years. OK, so you got to grade four or five-ish? I did an examination in 1964, grade three. OK. And then we skipped grade four and the music teacher said, well, I think you're making good progress, so we'll put you in for grade five. And uh, that was in 1966, yes, 1966. And I struggled with that. Uh, and because of one reason for that was that, you know, I was distracted by all the pop music I was listening to. And the fact that uh, I, would, I found these friends in the village who were also nuts on pop music and wanted to start a band. They were just beginning as well. We were all kind of keen on getting guitars and drums and learning how to play. And, uh, of course, the piano, uh, my, my dedica dedication, what little devotion I had toward the piano was pretty much wiped out by that. And so, um, uh, eventually, cut a long story short, within weeks of getting my first electric guitar, I was uh, my the, my piano teacher wrote to my mother and said, "Look, I'm going to have to let David go. He's not interested anymore. He's not practicing. He's struggling with this with this exam material. So I'm going to have to let him go." And of course, Mum was not in not in the least bit pleased about that. 
So her her ideas of you playing Beethoven for them while they're making Sunday lunch was out the window at that point. <laughs> it probably was. <laughs> so the 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 village band, the town band that you were getting together with your friends, how did that kind of hove into view? Did you have a space where you could go and practice? Was that a school thing? It was a school thing. Uh, it's a friend of mine called Martin Wolford who I'm still in touch with on Facebook. He's an estate agent now. Mm. Uh, he was, uh, his parents were um, a bit more li- liberal with, uh, I mean, I remember going up to this house. He said, oh, you've got to come round. Uh, I've got the new Beatles album. It was Revolver. It would have been, mm. yes, August of 1966. So we were both uh, 13 years old. He said, come round and have a listen to the new bit, it's great. So I said, yeah, I'd love to. So went round to his house, we sat, and I just sat in this chair listening to this. Amazing, I think we we played it twice through from start to finish. I just thought, you lucky bugger. How did you get? <laughs> You've got the whole LP, a, a Beatles LP, the brand new Beatles LP. It's all yours, and you can play it whenever you want. <laughs> you lucky. Anyway, that was kind of... That was where it started, with the group thing started. Mm. And he said, well, I've got this uh, guitar. I had a Selma Little Giant amplifier mm. and a Barnes & Mullins semi-acoustic guitar. I said, yeah, but I want to play bass, I said. I want to be the bass player. Can your friend, uh, your friend Chris has got a, a set of drums, or he had this <laughs> little sort of cardboard drums. <laughs> I'm not sure if they weren't sort of, uh, you know, product of uh, Noddy and Big Ears or something like that. It was one of the <laughs> little, but you know, that's a good place to start. He can, he can learn to play and we can, we can, perhaps we can get together, but I'm definitely playing bass. I think Chris has got an acoustic guitar. We can take the top two strings off and tune the other ones down and you can, uh, you can play on that. It was just this tiny little cheap thing. That's another thing that, remi- that reminds me, and I've, t- I've told this story a number of times and people don't believe me. The reason I wanted to be a bass player was in the spring of 1966, a mysterious object descended from somewhere, some from space, and landed in the front window of Duck Sun and Pinker's music shop in, in Fleet Street in Swindon in the form of a Fender Telecaster bass. Ooh. Now, I say it's spring of 66 and people say, oh yeah, the Telecaster, hey, no nah, mate, no, you got it wrong there, mate. No, they didn't produce the Telecaster bass till 68. No, nah, you're mistaken. No, I'm not. I remember it clearly. And I looked at this thing, because you used to have to walk past this big music store. They had it. One corner was devoted to group gear. It was a tiny little corner of the shop. Mostly they sold sheet music and grand pianos. That was what they did. And so um, I'm being interrupted now. Hang on a minute. No, no. Oh, this is a nuisance. Something has popped up. There, it's gone. You can edit that out. (laughs) But I looked at this amazing thing. It was in the window on a stand at a ridiculous price, something like 130 guineas. I thought, who's going to, who's got the money to buy? You could buy, you put a deposit on a house in Swindon for that much in in (sighs) the time. And I didn't know about Fender or I know anything about electric guitars. I I was trying to read what was on the headstock. And it looked Fender. It's an odd thing to call a a guitar, a musical instrument. That's that's an American term for, for a car bumper, isn't it? What's that? But it was brand spanking new. And uh, and it was there for months, as you can imagine. How many people in Swindon in those days had that sort of money to spend on an electric guitar? I thought one day I'll have, a, a, you know, I really, really want this thing so badly. But it's way out of my reach. But first of all, I've got to learn how to play. So that was the inspiration for me wanting to be a bass player. (laughs) What happened to that bass, I don't know, because I've mentioned it to people in town. Very few. Only my brother Ian, he remembers it. And he's been looking for it ever since as well. Uh, But it's just vanished after. It was in the window for must be four or five months. Yeah. And um, 
What happened to it, I don't know. But years later, I discovered that uh, that year, CBS, who'd taken over Fender, had put together some uh, uh, bases from old bits and bobs from the 50s, including the slab-bodied precision bass, which they've never reissued, much to my... Uh, I think you can order one if you've got you know, a mortgage. You can <laughs> order one from the custom shop. But it's the most handsome bass that Fender ever made, in my humble opinion, as well as these few precision bases with the slab bodies that came over. They did a handful of, of telecasters as well. They were basically like the, Fend the 1950s Fender precision, uh, but because the, the, they redesigned the precision base in 1958, they had to call it something else, so they called it the telecaster base. Uh, so did you? how many years was it after seeing this mystical thing in the window that you actually got to play or even own one of these well i never i've still to this day never owned a, a, fe oh. a, a telecaster base <laughs> but i'll keep looking <laughs> but the first fender guitar i owned was um yes that was in april of 1970 and prior to that i i, I, I worked up i traded in the rossetti and got a hofner very thin which is a great guitar. I really loved that. And I recently found one that was uh, identical to the one that I had and um, paid a good deal more money for it. But yeah, really underrated guitar, actually. Although most of the ones you see for sale nowadays, um, you know, the pickups don't work. Matt mm, probably, yeah. it's uh, a <laughs> <laughs> share of rewinds of Hofner, those little uh, picks pickups. Yeah. They're, they're horrible things. But when they're working, they do sound good. It's, yeah. a, it's a great sounding guitar. Anyway, traded that in for uh, a 1963 Stratocaster. And here I have to hold my hands up and say that I vandalized that guitar. Um, it was, yeah, there, was a, there was a problem with the, um, I'd, I'd gone to London, put a deposit on a, a, a Fiesta Red, really quite a, quite a scruffy Fiesta Red Strat. I won't mention the music shop. It was in Water Street. And I put a deposit on it uh, and said, right, well, um, can you hold the guitar for a week? I'll be back the following Saturday with uh, the rest of the money. I had to twist my dad's arm to loan me 50 quid. So uh, back I went with the with the rest of the money in my till my de the receipt. And of course, uh, oh, my, yeah, uh, no, that guitar has been sold. I said, yeah, I bought it. No, 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 no. It, we sold it yesterday. Um, it's gone. Sorry. Um, oh, dear. Oh, no. I was so disappointed. I can't tell you because this was something that I'd been looking forward to my whole life. And, um, you know, I just... What you, anyway, they said, um, look, we've got a sister shop in Shaftesbury Avenue. They've got a Stratocaster in there. It's a bit more money than uh, the one you've, you, 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 you put the deposit on, but they've agreed to let that go as a result of our mistake. So take this docket and take it up to. So around the corner I went, and sure enough, they had this um, really nice, looking back on it, it was a really beautiful Strat, 63 Strat in burgundy mist. Oh, nice. And... Uh, now, as a 17-year-old, I didn't rate Burgundy Mist. I <laughs> really poncy. And I didn't know it was a Fender custom colour. I had no idea about that. It just looked like someone had uh, stripped off a, a sunburst and, and sprayed it with a... But no, it, was, it, it just didn't look right. But it was a gorgeous guitar. What did I do? Within weeks of getting it home, got the sander out, took it down to the wood. Hippie wood. That's what everyone was doing in 1970. If you had a Stratocaster or a Tele, you stripped it back to the wood. And so um, that's what I did. And uh, it's easy to look back at that now and and, uh, and say how foolish that a, 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 an act that might have been. But we had no idea. Nobody did about you know there was no vintage market. Uh, that guitar was, you know, in the shop for 80 quid. Mm. Um, that's what you paid for a second-hand guitar. Mm. Um, 
how you times know, have changed. <laughs> times have changed slightly. Yeah. So, when so, as I say, yeah, hang on to it, I'd have left it alone. <laughs> you know, you, you know, maybe 25 grand, I don't know. It's yeah. not something I can, I can dwell on anymore. No. <laughs> so, when did you start? When did you take the band with um, the down tunes, you know, guitar and the noddy drums? When did you start playing? Like, did you ever play, do any shows with that band? Yeah, we the three of us got together and we 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 spent from the summer until the Christmas until I got my first electric guitar, um, just learning songs. And we tried writing a couple of little songs as well, but they were just like skiff, it was like a little skiffle outfit. And we got together and there was a youth club in the village. This is the village of Purton, which is um, near Swindon. This is where, where, where we grew up. And we played at the local youth club, which was up on the uh, Methodist, uh, there was a Methodist hall up in uh, a little park in Purton. And that's where we, we first started playing. And then a few weeks later, we got a gig at the Silver Threads Hut, which mm. was um, a, a sort of old folks meeting place in the, in the high street. And that when we played a few times, um, we met another guy in, in the village who was uh, anxious to play bass. By this time, it was decided, yeah, I'd made too much progress on this little guitar. And now I had a six string guitar. Bass would have to go to somebody else. So someone else was going to play bass. And, and uh, my job was to play lead guitar. And that's kind of it was just natural selection, I suppose. Mm. And we found... Um, another friend in the village who was anxious to play and be in a band and he bought a bass. He bought a catalogue bass, a Vox Clubman bass out of the catalogue. And uh, we thought, wow, this is easy, yeah, he's in. He's got a proper red bass guitar, <laughs> and a future armour amp. He's definitely in. Um, that kind of, uh, so throughout 1967, we were just, you know, attempting again, learning how to play and covering all the tunes of the day or attempting to get close to covering those songs. At the same time, presumably swatting for our O-levels. Uh, mm. uh, yeah, that was a bit of a disaster. And did you have any did you have any aspiration to write songs of your own or was that not? Did you just want to play in a band and do gigs? Well, we felt that um, playing in a band was a really great way of um, grabbing attention. Mm. And if we could back that up with some really cool stuff of our own, that was an added bonus. But I think at that age, you just want attention. Yeah. <laughs> You're not serious about creating good art or doing anything. You know, it's just like, look at me, look at me. Yeah. That was uh, that, that was the thinking at the time. The need to uh, write songs, yeah, that 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 kind of um, dawned on us at a later stage, but we never really got very far with that because I think over the, over the years you realise songwriters are born; they're not made. Sure. Plenty of people can learn to play an instrument and get very good at it, but mm. songwriting that's um, that's a gift from God. Mm. Used to be a good songwriter. I mean, most most of us can write a song, but to, to get it to a point where um, you can make a living at it or, or be recognised as a songwriter, mm. that's that's a very rare talent. Yeah. It's it's almost like an instrument in itself, but you sort of have to be learning and becoming conversant with it from very very young in order to hit your stride when you know in your late teens, early twenties, you are feeling this upwelling of emotion and things that you want to express. Um, and so, yeah, I th it's, who can say, again, it's a mysterious thing, the songwriter thing, and why a certain combination of notes and words can just kind of punch you in the chest. You feel like you've been physically punched in the chest. Yes. Um, it's, it's, it is an incredible thing. I think the fact that um, it's like what you say about this welling up of emotion, most of us have a, you know, a cut off point whereby we don't want to reveal that much about ourselves. Mm. That's the inhibiting factor that uh, prevents a lot of people. Certainly, I think from my point of view, it's not something that I feel comfortable expressing or mm. do justice to or, or feeling that I express myself adequately enough. Uh, to, 
you know, to avoid being laughed at, basically, yeah. or, or criticised, or, or it, it's it's yeah. You, you tend to keep those those sort of feelings covered up. It's and it's it's almost it it feels like. I mean, I I've had my attempt at writing songs over the years. Um, sadly, I haven't been able to do it for a few years now. But you feel if you if you make a mistake on your instrument then it's just a mistake on your instrument. But if you write a song and it's perceived in a way that you don't want it to be perceived or it's perceived as naive or clumsy or ripping something else on, it sort of strikes right at the core of self, doesn't it? Which is, so so being vulnerable like that is is a big step to take, I think. I was watching the, uh, I've become really a huge fan of uh, Amy Winehouse. I was watching last week a documentary about the making of Back to Black, a record that I love, and the more I play it, the deeper it gets. Mm. And you imagine, uh, you know, someone that age, she just had this amazing facility going through all the, all the horrible stuff she was going to emotionally, mm. putting that so perfectly into words and music. Uh, at such a young age, you know, it was. It's a shame that her story is more about the story rather than the talent. You know, she's mm. this kind of media uh, talking point. But I think it's it's, kind of, it's the sad thing is that that has overshadowed the music that she made. But again, that that is a songwriter and someone mm. a performer as well. Um, you can't imagine her ever doing anything else. Um, professionally as it were you know and it's just a shame that uh, it took so much grief to get her to that point and did you it, maybe these are things which have been crystallized in in later life but did you if you didn't consider yourself a songwriter did you f- feel yourself gravitating towards people who you felt had that gift and you wanted to be around them because I don't know. It it was more exciting to make music with people who were making original music, which expressed similar feel, maybe feelings that you would like to have expressed, and yes. they were just kind of capturing it in in a vocal. Yeah, but definitely. Uh, and I've been lucky enough to work with uh, with some great songwriters, some really really good uh, people who, who, because it's like um, <clears throat> if I. I've got, I've got a sort of reputation as a guitar player, but then again, you see, I've worked on some really classic, classy songs, mm. not just with XTC, but with um, Big Big Train. Uh, it's a very different type of music, you know, progressive rock, but they're, they're David London and Greg Sporton are, are really superb songwriters, but they're more... Um, objective they're not really um i mean there is a lot of emotion in what they're what they're writing about but they tend to pick on subjects that are less Mm -hmm. um personal you know they're the observers there's personal stuff as well of course but you know so i'm very lucky in having worked with these people that uh, i i have you know what is what, what might be considered a reputation now for my own my, my own part, I can always start a song. As, as, as you're talking about songwriting, I can start a song, I can't finish one. Mm-hmm. I always struggle with lyrics. And I'm not really very imaginative in that department. But if I hear uh, a melody or a chord sequence and a line of lyrics that says something to me, then I can hopefully adapt it on guitar and complement it. Mm. And that's that's really key, isn't it, making original music? You have to, and I was, I've been think this idea has been bowling around in my head the last few days about serving the song. And that's a funny, it's a funny expression because it's kind of, it can be taken very superficially, but until you have developed the skill of being able to contribute a part or parts to a song which serve the song, you sort of don't have a deeper understanding of what that actually means because serving the song doesn't mean just staying out the way of all the other stuff going on it's it's almost like another i don't know i can't think of a good a good metaphor for it. it's almost like another cylinder in an engine 
yeah. which suddenly gives it gives the song more power so you're not competing with the other elements in the song but you're rejuvenating them and adding and you know kind of the steamroller so, effect yeah the idea of course is to take the song to the next level mm. And yeah. uh, that's what I always try and do. I, I you know, I, I don't like the feeling of being just a passenger. Mm. I have to contribute and hopefully enhance what the uh, what the songwriters are doing. You know, and I, I hope that um, you always hope that the songwriter is going to approve of what what you've brought to the table. Mm. And um, and hopefully add it to it to his recipe and 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 hope that it's. Uh, that it, it, it works in the finished mix, that it survives the mix. Because <laughs> <laughs> there's always the uh, the mute button is uh, is usually employed at uh, certain discrete. <laughs> then never mind. Yeah, that's the thing. Think about what the artist is trying to say, mm-hmm. and um, find the right sound. And I'm lucky here because I have a house full of guitars, and um, most. Most of the uh, that's 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 it sounds a bit kind of facetious to say it, but you know that one of the biggest problems for me was choosing which guitar I'm going to use for any particular mm-hmm. song. Uh, it, it can be a struggle sometimes, and I hope you know there's people with their with their first guitar who've just started out thinking, oh, who's this who's this big headed twat? What are you talking about? <laughs> All these guitars. His biggest problem is choosing which guitar he's going to use. Oh my God. <laughs> but the the thing is, though, that it, you're the tool that you use to do a job in a in a creative sense can inform massively. Like it it can be tangential, can't it? it mm-hmm. In in to the degree that it can send you off in a completely different direction than so. This guitar, uh, Les Paul, might make you play in a certain way the way kind of in the way that we were talking about before having an instrument that you're used to and you fall into patterns because of things that you hear another instrument might make you play something completely different um and so it's it it is it's all part of that creative process building on building on building on um and if you know the the direction that you're going then uh, that's although like the the 14 year old you may have thought what a pillock you know (laughs) (laughs) but the 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 man that you are now see has done enough and had all the toys and in fact matt and i were talking earlier on about how we have become less focused on gear as we've got older just kind of almost as a as a thing in itself rather than in order to facilitate musical expression it's they've become channels to you know to do to do different things mm-hmm. um whereas when and it, actually this kind of comes back to where we came in before matt did his intro pouring over magazines when when you were younger you just kind of think oh, if only i had this guitar or this amp then yeah. i would you know then i would be able to create the the magnum opus <laughs> you, you could say yeah i can remember thinking yeah well i'll never play like uh jimmy hendrix because i don't have you know a marshall mm. stack a mm. fuzz face pedal and a stratocaster you know all i've got is a hoffner very thin and a vox ac30 so i'm i'm ne- that for that reason i'm never going to play like jimmy, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <twat. laughs> play like jimmy hendrix never <laughs> and so yeah, you can use that as a, 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 and I remember sort of looking through these and, and there would be ads in Beat Instrumental. That was the magazine that I used to get every month. And there'd be full page ads for, from Dallas Arbiter for the new Fender gear, you know, uh, Stratocasters and Telecasters, 171 guineas, 235 guineas. Gretsch guitars were off the scale. I mean, you couldn't have what? Well, you know, by the time I've saved up that much money to buy one of these fancy instruments, I'll be too old to play anyway. Mm. So you, you, there's this sort of mental thing about, well, you know, I'll never be any good because I, I, I'll never be able to afford the gear, mm. which is a, a very adolescent way of looking at it. But it's yeah, I it it would be. I wish I could have, and there are some 
music musician friends who just did this naturally i wish i could have told my 16 17 18 year old self don't worry about the gear that you have just focus on what you want to create because the gear it it might become characteristic it might inform it but just try and focus on what you're trying to create rather than worrying about oh well i can't do it now because i haven't got the perfect rig don't just forget that because there is no perfect rig and you'll probably try and perfect your rig for the next 60 years yeah. just focus on the thing that you say that you want to that you want to output yes that's right but it doesn't that that won't stop you from being aspirational and mm. wanting this stuff of course yeah and uh, it's it, i think it's good that you know i see a lot of kids nowadays when they're starting out you know there's a world of stuff that's affordable now mm. um you know you can dial in sounds that like look at their little pod which incidentally i still use at home here for for doing recording it's a, a tiny you know a couple of hundred quid you've got a, a universe of amplifiers and effects in there that are perfectly usable for recording at home i, I wouldn't necessarily say perhaps on stage necessarily, but that's a very, very cheap and adaptable and usable piece of kit. Mm. And um, guitars, you know, it's a lot of these Chinese instruments, I don't know what you think about them, but uh, I can't see that there's that much difference in paying uh, 200 pounds for a Squire Stratocaster or paying 1500 for a custom shop Strat. There's not that much difference in quality that ju to justify that sort of price. You know, I don't think you're going to do that much more on a custom shop Strat than you could do on a, a Squire Stratocaster. If you, if, if you know, it, it's not actually necessarily going to make you a better player mm -hmm. in, in, in the short term anyway. Certainly while you're learning, if it makes a noise and it doesn't turn your fingers into a bloody mess, then um, it's probably good enough. I mean, uh, this, I don't know whether I can reach this guitar without pulling my, pulling my phone off the stand, but this is, uh, this is my first guitar. Uh -huh. it, look how hilarious it is. <laughs> Man, it, it's, a, know, look, it, it, there's, it's missing an inlay there. I don't know whether you can see that. Uh -huh. The inlay actually fell out. They did okay. such a good job of putting that in. <laughs> But it was, you know, like, it they'll wasn't. They'll come back it, into fashion, don't you worry, Steve. They'll come back into fashion and uh, you'll be able to, um, you know, should you ever choose to move it on, I'm sure it'll, you'll get some good money for that. 20 but years. It was, it, that was kind of the, that was made, it wasn't even made in China. That was made in Korea yes. in the 90s. But it, it gave me the entry into a guitar which was playable. Yeah. Um, and I still use it because I know the sound of it. I've been using it on uh, on the next pedal that I've been developing over. I'm not going to tell you how many months and years, um, <laughs> but it's 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 just a thing that makes noise. It plays well enough, and you know I could yes maybe a custom shop whatever would have been m mildly more pleasant to play and the noise would have been nicer. But once you know the sound of a thing, it's kind of irrelevant. You yeah. know, just just do the thing. Don't worry about buying stuff yeah the other trap that i've fallen into is uh, and i might as well uh, own up about it is you know the, the snobbery aspect mm. you know you have if it's it started with this whole pre-cbs thing with fender guitars and it's certainly true that uh, within a couple of years of cbs taking over the company uh, the quality just went right into the toilet i'm sorry i have to say it um, <laughs> but you know that's really why the vintage market became so um, so vibrant and, and just took off. People realised, well, if you if you if you want this old gear, you're going to have to first of all find it and pay the man. And the man, you know, has <laughs> it's it's a seller's market. Always yeah. was. But if you're not concerned about that, um, the snobbery aspect of the vintage quality, uh, there's no end of really really great gear out there that sounds and plays really well and uh, makes makes learning the guitar a good deal easier than it was in when, when i started out certainly yeah it, going back to the like the music um, side of things but when 
when did you start sort of seeing music as a as a job like doing as, as a kind of a um as what you did when did that kind of as a career you mean exactly sorry yeah. see brain well, falling out here. <laughs> I didn't have a career as such or a full-time musical job until I joined XTC and that was in 1979. Before all of that, it was just wishful thinking and impossible dreams. It was what I always wanted to do, but yeah. because it was such a, um, a remote possibility, yeah. uh, I never, you know, it was a question of, well, I've got to do a day job because I need money. I need to, you know pay the bills yeah. and I need to buy guitar strings and if I save up enough I can, I can buy another guitar next year and maybe an amplifier as well. So what did you do, what was your day job? At the time, um, well I had a number of day jobs, when I left school I went to work in a factory in Malmesbury uh, as a progress chaser and I was there for about six years and <laughs> it was just sort of talk about a square peg in a round hole uh, it, it just it was just all it, i mean it, it, i made some good friends there it was fun going to work the job itself was just horrible and uh, so when i was made redundant in 1973 i think it was uh, no it wasn't no in 1976 spring of 76 redundancy notices came around my name was on the list and at the same time a friend of mine had um who worked in a, another music shop in Swindon, said, oh, there's this prog rock band down in the Forest of Dean looking for a guitar player. Uh, they're pro, they're fully pro. And um, would you, you know, do you fancy checking them out and going for the audition? I said, well, I've, I've just been made redundant. Maybe now's the time to, um, you know, jump, jump in and, and see how far this thing goes as a, as a pro musician. Cut a long story short, um, they were, they were a great band. They were called Profile at the time. Three piece Hammond organ, uh, Hammond organ who, uh, who doubled with bass pedals as well. I'd never seen that in a rock context. And a drummer, and they both sang. And they were writing their own material based, as I say, down in Colford in the Forest of Dean, long way from anywhere. And they, but they were good. I mean, they were good musicians. I'd, I think they were really. They, they had something going. But in the spring of 1976, punk was about to wipe everything off the chart. Mm. And they were doing possibly the kind of music that was as far away from that, that, mm. that ethos as, as, it was like, as it was possible to be. But it didn't matter to me. I just wanted to make music. And um, I had this uh, redundancy payment. So I had a little bit of money in the bank. I thought, well, I can give this a year and see see what happens mm. and um well as it turns out say they were professional really just meant they were they didn't have day jobs <laughs> they were on the dole and um they had no management they had no work i figured well never mind we, we can work this and uh, we'll do some work and uh, see see how far we can go and then we'll make some phone calls and see if we can get some get some work somewhere or other. And right throughout the summer of 76, blazing hot summer, we worked up a, whole, a set of songs. Really, uh, you know, if I could be transported back there today and listen to what we were doing, I'd probably be quite impressed. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> because prog rock now is kind of acceptable. People are listening to it and it's, you know, as I say, big, big train doing very well at the moment and I think Profile Gogmagog, as I think we renamed ourselves, would have fitted in with that with that school of thought today a lot better than it did in 1976. Suffice to say at the end of that year I, I just ran out of money. I said look guys I can't, I, I really, you know, things are not looking good out there for, for bands like us. I'm not really prepared to go on uh, living on the breadline. I've, I've no money now. I've, I've got less than two pounds in my bank account. I've just got to go back back to Swindon and get a job. Mm. They weren't pleased about that because, of course, they'd been we'd all been working hard on this music, yeah. getting nowhere with it, and they put a lot of work and time into it as I, as I had. So I left there under a bit of a cloud, and um, you know we we lost contact. And I know they were looking for a guitar player for 
for quite a long time after I left. Um, and uh, I don't think it, it really ever happened for either of them, which is a shame. They were good musicians. Mm. And, um, you know, I'm sure there's similar stories nationwide, you know, about what happened with punk and how it, how it changed the, the, the musical landscape in this country. Anyway, I came back to Swindon uh, to, to, the, to the family house in Purton and, uh, of course, my mum said, well, you've got you to stay here forever. You've got to get a job and it's time you were out. <laughs> said, yes, you're right, mum. It's time I was out. <laughs> so I got a job at uh, White Arrow, which was um, now a company called, um, y- uh, what are they called now? Yodel. Mm, right. Hayes catalogue delivery. That's right. Yes, exactly. Hayes and British, uh, what was it? British, um, not British home stores. Um, BM, BM, anyway. Yeah. Hayes catalogue, uh, mail order thingies. Mail order catalogue delivery. And it was good because, of course, you worked on a bonus. So the more parcels you could get rid of in a day, you know, the more bonus you got at the end of the week. And it was quite well paid, but it was bloody hard work, honestly, and quite dangerous as well, because it meant that from the time you did your first drop, you were running just to empty the van. You couldn't take any parcels back to the depot with you. You know, they all had to go. And um, because my ma- my brand was based in Bristol, for the first hour of the day, I wasn't doing any delivery at all. I was driving on, along the motorway from Swindon. So that was a little bit unfair. Yeah. But uh, I stuck that for 18 months and I saved up enough money to put a deposit on a little house in Swindon. And uh, my brother Ian, uh, he decided it was time he was leaving home as well. So we decided, well, OK, I'll, I'll take care of the mortgage. You pay me a, a weekly rent and uh, you can, you, you know, we'll do it that way. So he helped me out with the mortgage repayments in the early days or well, within weeks of moving into this house phone rings and it's uh, Andy Partridge saying oh we've just lost this guy we just lost Barry uh, the keyboard player um, he's decided to leave the group and we've uh, you know we've got it all to do right now do you fancy auditioning and, and joining the band that's the last thing I was expecting to hear from Andy because you know I was not uh, in any way at that, that at that time in early 79 I was uh, playing in an R&B boot group doing pub rock, you know, covers like Pirates and Dr. Feelgood. That was basically the repertoire we were doing. It's a yes. lot of fun, but it wasn't really, uh, you know, the sort of music that XTC was likely to be playing. So, uh, yeah, I went along, auditioned for them, and they kind of um, just embraced me and, and let me into their world. And suddenly I found myself in a professional band. Mm. without really trying and um it all it, yeah so the, the early months of 79 was where everything my, my life changed so for the better i have to say i mean i'm so grateful that uh, i was given that opportunity yeah. and so that was basically how it started we did this we cut a single life begins at the hop and within weeks we were in the studio again working on the album that would be drums and wires mm. and that turned the band's fortunes around you know it was a completely different record from the previous two and we were worried that uh, well maybe our audience wasn't going to accept me you know they were hoping to hear this this vintage electronic organ sound that was a big part of the early xtc sound uh, to be replaced with his wiry guitar fortunately Colin Moulding had written this song, Making Plans for Nigel, and mm-hmm. that was the lead single off the album. And God help us, it was a hit. We did Top of the Pops, and um, well, yeah, things progressed from that point. Did you, when you, when you were kind of embraced by the rest of the band, did you, going back to the songwriter and you serving the song, that whole thing, was that automatically obvious to you that yes i can serve this songwriting team and what i have to do is or what i can produce is valid and it does take it up to the next level or did it take a little while to bed in on that it did take a little while to bed in but not as long as uh, you might think because i just found that uh, the songs were so good you know i mean mm. it's like you had andy and colin between them 
and he had the lion's share of the writing, but every song was a gem, but mm. in an odd way. I mean, for example, I can remember we rehearsed the album in uh, this freezing damp cellar in Swindon that was underneath the manager's club, in uh, underneath the Wyvern Theatre. And next door was a Chinese restaurant kitchen. So you'd have this rattle of pots and pans and people <laughs> shouting at each other coming through the walls and we'd be huddled around a single bar electric fire making noise with <laughs> with our instruments that was how we rehearsed that album and it was a case of it was just like you know being a band in a youth club we've got these new songs to learn here's here's, here's here they are let's see what we can do with this also we had to be mindful of the fact that we were going to be going out on tour we had to be able to reproduce this music on stage that was that was the first, you know, is it playable? Can we deliver it live? If it was, it was in. But some of the stuff that was coming, I mean, for example, I don't know if you're familiar with the album, there's a song called Road Skirt or The Globe. And I remember <laughs> Andy coming up with us, is he serious about doing this? Are we, can we make this work? Is it ever going to work? Well, let's just play it. I'll do what comes naturally to me and I'll be watching Andy and seeing if he's uh, approving of what I'm doing. But he didn't turn a hair at anything, you know, some of the bizarre stuff I was coming out with to complement what he was doing with this very, very weird song. Mm. But, you know, by the time we'd knocked it around, it all f it all flowed quite naturally. And I thought, well, this is, uh, this is a brand new way of thinking about music for me. What else have you got? Let's just keep going until someone says stop or I'm fired or whatever. <laughs> and what do you what do you think made you come out with the weird stuff that you did? Because it doesn't sound like you were. I mean, I guess you you did that year of prog rock. So maybe that was, you know, that lit the, the touch paper for the weirdness. Do you do you think that's the case? Because you would do, if you're doing R&B, then that wouldn't necessarily lend itself to you making lots of weird guitar parts up. No, that's right. Well, the R&B thing, that was where the energy was, because mm. it was high energy music. And that was definitely something that XTC had in in, in, in spades. Mm. At the time. Uh, but I think it was just my natural ear for music and just um, just kind of wanting to join, wanting to belong and thinking and just examining what I was, you know, listening to the uh, how he was forming these chords and where they were going. I think, yeah, when I've got to follow this down this crooked path and see, uh, see and just not not fall over or stumble and fall, you know, just 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 go where my ear was taking me as a result, what I was hearing from the other instruments. Mm. Um, and again, you know, Colin Moulding's bass line on that particular song, I'm just, just remembering that song because it was one of the oddest things on the record. Um, Moulding's bass line, it's just, it, I'd never heard anyone play anything like that. It was just the, the, the weirdest thing. But it, but it was fun. That was the whole thing. You know, we had to keep it, we didn't want to get bogged down in anything too mm. doom laden. Mm. It had to be fun and it had it, to be there was I was listening to something yesterday and I can't remember what it was and again it's difficult to ascribe guitar parts to you or to Andy but there was almost and I can't remember what what era no I suppose it would have been about the same era Devo did it were they on your radar at all yes very much so yes okay. they were so there's a, li a little lo lilt of that in Nigel certainly yes we were big fans of Devo, um, although I'd never heard of them before I joined the band. You see, there's something else. A lot of the stuff that uh, filtered through to me came through the cassette player in the in the tour van. Right. And so they'd be coming in with stuff like Devo and Iggy Pop and uh, some David Bowie stuff that I hadn't heard. And bands like um, Lou, and people like uh, Lou Reed, maybe there was some Lou Reed stuff I seem to remember. And re a lot of dub, dub reggae, mm. style of music that I had no knowledge of at all. And um, so my cassettes would have been things like, you know, Tamla Motown, Steely Dan, a lot of American <laughs> music and stuff. that They didn't get played very often. <laughs> but Devo and all the new wave stuff, 
that again opened my ears to a different way of thinking about music and just how to how to apply what I could do in that style. Mm. And again, you mentioned Devo. There was a lot of comedy in that music as well. Yeah. That, that was another big factor. There was a, a, the humour element. Yeah, the, so, the fun element. It's got to yeah. be fun for us to do this. Yeah, exactly. How, how did you find uh, touring and stuff and going on the road for the first time? And how, did, how was that? Uh, it was an education. It was great <laughs> because uh, it meant that uh, whether I wanted to or not, we were out playing ev virtually every night of the week. Once the tour had started, it was what I'd always wanted to do, just yeah. get on stage and play. Yeah. Uh, it, but again, it, it was a little, the first tour I did in the spring of 79. We were promoting uh, Life Begins at the Hop, which was the first single that I'd done with the band. And um, <clears throat> I was at the time having to adapt some of Barry Andrews' keyboard parts on guitar. Wow. didn't always work and it didn't always feel comfortable and so uh, and I, and there was a you know we, we did that for the next um, the next year at least in right through 1980 there was we were still playing some songs like uh, into the atom age for example which started out with this sort of bizarre little keyboard thing that didn't really translate to guitar very well but you know we got around it because i think the audiences just want to hear the songs mm. they're less concerned about how the songs are delivered as long as they the singer is in the center stage bellowing out the lyrics that they're familiar mm. with the tune uh, you know the, it's um that's near enough for, for most audiences it's about communication isn't it really yeah. and so they're not necessarily going to want to hear exactly what they hear on their LP or on the radio or whatever. They want to go there and feel like they're part of something. Yes. Um, and it, th this is not related necessarily, but in in that kind of that era of the band's music, I also hear a little bit of the police. Is, was that, I mean, I, I know that you were, contemporary was that conscious or subconscious or just because they were such a an overwhelming presence uh we didn't um until we worked with the police on tour because i don't know if you're aware we did two, ah, two tours with the police in the it state. makes sense yeah yes. uh their manager miles copeland i think um had designs on managing us for america but our yeah. management uh, wasn't going to have that you know they <laughs> said well no we we've got them for the world but at the same time, they were very, you know, Miles gave us the opportunity to work with the police and we supported them on tour throughout 1980. Uh, uh, we did a few dates with them in, on the first tour in the early months of 80. And then we did uh, these huge stadium gigs mm. uh, in November in the States. And it was a good pairing. We made a lot of friends as a result of that, you know, to have the opportunity to play to that many people was a real, real stroke of good fortune for us. And even though it didn't break us in the States, it did draw us, it, it draw attention to us, you know, to, to a much larger audience as a result of those shows that we did with them. And we got along, you know, we shared a bus, in fact, at one point. Oh, wow. <laughs> and um, that was, you know, we, we became friends, not close friends, but we certainly weren't... Um, we weren't competing with the police. Uh, mm. I, I, we we weren't so crazy about their records. Uh, not the first couple. We thought they were a little bit cliched. And but when you saw them live, suddenly mm. I remember thinking at the time, you know, it's announced that the American tour. We were going to be doing some dates with the police. I thought, oh, yeah, well, whatever, all right. <laughs> When I saw them, uh, and I had that rather snooty attitude until I saw them play live. Uh, live, they were something else, a really phenomenal live band. And so we said, well, yeah, OK, well, we'll, we'll just support this band for as long as they let us on their stage. <laughs> Respect is due. <laughs> and uh, can you, either at the time or maybe retrospectively, can you put a finger on a way that either you individually or the band collectively changed as a result of that experience of playing either or maybe both with a band to support a band like the police and also to that many people? Because it, it must change the way that you approach things to a degree. 
I don't know that we did because um, we didn't pay enough attention to stagecraft looking back. Okay. It was mainly, um, I don't know whether that was at the root of why Andy developed this stage fright and just decided mm. to, want to, you know, to, to draw down the curtain on touring. I don't know. Um, looking back and listening, because uh, just recently I've been listening to some live recordings that were made at the time and it's it's pretty pretty jagged pretty rough and even uh, there's there's some cassettes of uh, the shows that we did on in madison square gardens with the cars supporting the cars wow. we did two shows there and one at nato coliseum and uh, it's it's pretty rough it's pretty rough and um i think probably if we were going to continue touring and continue presenting a live show, we would have had to uh, perhaps make a few more co concessions to stagecraft and theatricality, or at least design. Yeah, the English Settlement Tour that we did in 1982, the one we did that wasn't finished, we did have this magnificent backdrop made of uh, like an old stockade and like an old English... Um, I you describe it like a... Like a kind of well a settlement yeah. <laughs> an early med an early prehistoric kind of um there, there were these um wooden frames with with uh, with cloth i can't really describe it now it is embarrassing <laughs> but those who remember if you've seen the rock palace performance uh, that we did in hamburg in 1982 you can see the set dressing it looked quite it looked pretty good it wasn't very good sound wise though because okay. <laughs> the amps had to sit behind these screens and uh, we, we haven't figured out that if you want to hear your amplifier you're going to have to you're going to have to feed the back the sound in from the from your amp into your wedge monitor you just in order to hear what you're playing you know so we hadn't, that really hadn't occurred to us at the time it was a great tour actually that one until it fell over and then it, everything finished uh, which was a huge shame uh, because the band was playing it was really really hot and that english settlement album came out and we had the hit with senses working overtime mm. everything was going well for the first time ever so it was a shame that all that, that side of things came to an end. But as Andy says, you know, had it not stopped, then the band may well have broken up. No more records would be made after English Settlement and um, there would have been no XTC mm -hmm. the next however many years. Did you, I mean, it, you, it must have been galling for you after having done those police shows and then started this next tour off the back of or supporting English Settlement saying right you know we're going to do this properly we've got the backdrop and our stagecraft is a bit more honed did you have any sense that maybe this was just not going to you know last the last the whole the course or or was it a surprise to you when it when it all kind of came tumbling down it was a surprise i i felt that all Andy needed was a rest, you really, mm. and I thought that uh, just took a, a month away from it, and um, and then because that was basically what happened once uh, the tour was cancelled in Paris, we took a month off before going to the States, um, and we flew all that gear over to the States <laughs> and played one show, Ouch. and um, and he he just he just didn't want to know. He didn't know, I have to say. <laughs> The audience at that one show, it was like Beatlemania. And it wasn't really? big because we hadn't been rehearsing. We were very rusty, but the audience just went nuts. Uh, it was almost like a stage invasion at the end of the night. This was in uh, San Diego. And um, I was thinking, wow, look, we've got this amazing tour lined up. By the end of it, by the time we get to New York, we're going to be superstars. Mm -hmm. But uh, no, I'm afraid we weren't. We, uh, oh, Andy just, uh, he just broke down and said, no, I'm going home. I can't do this. And that was that. But I was convinced that there were a number of factors involved. You know, we weren't being properly rewarded financially for all this work we were doing. We hadn't seen any accounts. Mm -hmm. There was nothing, you know, nobody really knew. Um, actually, we're in big trouble at the time financially, but nobody was really fully aware of that. Um, it took Andy 
cancelling everything to to come home and examine exactly what had been going on and uh, yes it led to a lot of problems but I, I thought that you know given enough time the urge to, for attention and the urge to, re, to return to the stage would would get the better of Andy mm. he'd reconvene and rethink things and uh, you know maybe maybe after another album we'd be able to go back out on the road again. In the meantime, of course, our drummer Terry Chambers decided to quit. And so um, everything from that point, from 1982, right up to the time that I quit in 98, we just remained a three piece and didn't play any gigs. Oh, that must be so galling after that. And it's either really really fantastic to go out on that high of the of the first american show or galling because it's just like a carrot dangled <laughs> this yeah. is what you could have had <laughs> Bye. yes yes absolutely but you know i i kept saying to myself look you lucked into this mm. this is something this isn't something you worked up from the ground like those other guys that the other people in the band have done you know you, you, i've forgotten that andy and colin and terry had played every toilet in the country mm. at least once yeah. prior to my arrival i just happened to jump on a moving bus and uh, and and just you know got lucky that way so i've got to be grateful for that and thankful for the time that we were able to do this and um as long as they still want me around then yeah let's let's make records from now on then okay fair enough that's that works for me i'm not making any money or not a lot of money anyway but it's way better than working yeah. and uh so i was grateful for the fact that uh, andy didn't say right you can all bugger off now i've had enough i'm just going to do things my way from now on he did have the good grace to say, I don't want us to break up. Let's just make records from now on. We can spend more time in the studio. We can do it all because MTV was coming in. We can make videos. We don't have to go out and drag ourselves around the, uh, around the world on these appalling money-losing tours. Uh, we, can, we can get a budget from the record company and, and make videos from now on. That's interesting. It's, I, I probably don't want to delve too deeply into all of the kind of management and label issues i know that you basically got taken for a ride fairly heavily um and didn't really get paid anything for either your record sales or your touring um and let's let's maybe leave it at that did um did you because you knew you weren't going to, going back to that first rehearsal that you did, your motivation was, we've got to be able to do this live. Did you feel liberated when you knew you weren't going to be touring to, to be a bit more adventurous and say, okay, actually, we could have 12 guitar parts on this song <laughs> or Gamelans or whatever? Yes, absolutely. And that was Andy's thinking all along. He said, you know, I'm no longer having to worry about how we're going to perform these songs. This studio, I mean, look at the potential of it. Mm. We've got uh, 24 channels here. There's no end of possibilities with what we can do. And as long as we've got the time to spend on working on this stuff, uh, the studio is the most fantastic place for to be creative mm. and not have to worry about, uh, you know, physical restraints like playing the bloody stuff live. <laughs> and so, yes, uh, but at the same time, you see, you lose a lot of the spontaneity and immediacy mm. that we missed. I mean, quite a lot of ideas I mean, came up for songs during sound checks, yeah. you know, just noodling around yeah. to, the, to the annoyance of every support band that ever came with <laughs> Just buggering about on in sound checks, you could get at no end of little uh, quirks and things, kind of magical stuff happening when you're not thinking about it. Whereas once in the studio, and also you have to remember, Andy and Colin now had home recording set up so they could demo their songs and present them to to to, to the band or whoever you know, people in the studio and say, well, this is how the song goes now. This is how I'd like it to sound. Um, also, probably. Uh, Get, get, was was less of an opportunity for me to to contribute. I don't know. I, it was okay. We we made it work, 
I think uh, the studio experience, we spent a lot more time on the records, which didn't always suit me because, as I say, I think I preferred the fact that um, if there was a clock ticking, it meant you worked harder mm. and you made decisions more quickly. But, you know, and then, of course, by the time the record came out, quite often there'd be a double album's worth of stuff. <laughs> Whereas, you know, there's two good albums in this. You know, we could split the budget, make some money, you know, save some money. We'll put this one out next. No, Andy said, no, 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 no. I've, I've, I've got to move on. I've got to move on to get these songs out of the way. Um, and uh, that was that was how he how he viewed the thing. He's very very prolific. There was never any shortage of new material. Never ever. That was you know most bands will break up as a result of lack of inspiration or just run out of ideas. Whatever. That was never the issue with XTC. What made what made you um, leave in 89, did you say? No, it was 98. 98, sorry. So I'd been... Uh, Dyslexia. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was a, a combination of a lot of things. Um, we'd left Virgin Records and oh, we, yeah, that's right, a number of changes at the record company, EMI had taken them over and it was completely different bunch of people who didn't really know who we were they weren't helping us they weren't really sympathetic to what we were trying to do um so there were a number of problems it took us a long time to establish a new uh record we, we, we had to sign a new deal mm -hmm. so we were going to these various companies saying look we're a band we haven't performed live for 16 years <laughs> uh, we've got a double album's worth of material we're not going to be promoting it we're not going to go out touring but we want the budget we want a budget to record double album's worth of material well you can imagine what the response was <laughs> we were not oh that's right we were not going to sign a, a royalty deal we've formed our own label and uh, what we'll be doing is licensing the label to you for a finite number of years in exchange for a recording, but you can see they just nobody was interested in that, mm -hmm. or very, very few. Um, so that was the first problem. Uh, my solution to all this was look, Andy, why don't we just find a drummer, put the band back together again, and do a, you know, a record of stuff we can perform live and go out and promote ourselves because everybody's forgotten about us. No, no, I, I can't do that. I just can't. You absolutely refuse to go down that route. So I had to sit back and say, well, all right. Then basically there were a lot of problems when we were recording the album that would be Apple Venus. Uh, we started, um, oh, yeah, oh, there were a number of problems. He'd done this, he had an agreement with uh, the studio down in Sussex that was, uh, you know, appeared on paper to be a very good deal but it meant that we'd have to um, find somewhere to stay. We rented this barn. Um, we got to the studio, it was broken. It, nothing oh, worked. Man. So we lost not only um, all the money we'd paid for um, the accommodation that we'd booked, the studio wasn't ready at all. We couldn't, we couldn't work there. We, did, we were able to get a few basic tracks recorded and um, as some recompense, the uh, people in charge of the studio uh, agreed to give us some free time uh, as, as a result of having to cancel all the work that we planned to do there. So we you made use of this free time. <laughs> the guy came in with a bill that said, uh, no, uh, this wasn't the agreement, was it? You agreed to give us some free time. We're not paying this bill. We're paying the costs, our costs, blah, 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 blah. blah. Oh, it just fits. So as a result of not paying this bill, um, they confiscated. They found, uh, you know, we packed everything up to, to, to move out. Um, and when when the stuff arrived at uh, Hayden Bendel's place, uh, the master tapes had gone. They confiscated the tapes. Oh, no. It was just an absolute farce. And so then I, well, I said to him, well, what are we going to do about this? So, well, we'll just move on. We'll just carry on. We'll book another studio. Hang on a minute. We haven't got any money. 
we've got no money. How are we going to uh, do? Well, we've got enough money. We can go back to Chipping Norton, start again from scratch. So, so you're just going to let them take these tapes and uh, we've, we're just going to write off all this money. And uh, he didn't, he didn't, uh, anyway, I don't really, I shouldn't really be telling you this, but the fact that Andy refused to lift a finger to correct the situation, I just thought, hang on a minute, this has gone too far now. I'm not too sure I want to be around this outfit very much longer unless things, unless I see some signs that uh, of this responsibility. You know, you can't just go, you know, being a spendthrift to this degree. It's just, we have yeah. Got the money to do that. Eventually, there was this: the issue arose of where where the money was going to come from to finish the record, because Andy was still intent on doing a double album. Oh my goodness! Even at this point, even at after losing point, all just, of that money, <laughs> yes, it just never. It, he just refused to examine the situation, and um, I'm sorry to have to say this publicly, but uh, that was really the, the heart of it. Was uh, you know, we were in the hands of a, a reckless spendthrift who had no concept of of um, budgetary restraints. Mm. And um, so the last straw came when he decided that he was going to, that he'd, he'd been, someone, uh, this company in America had offered to uh, uh, provide the money to mix the record. And, but, you know... <laughs> I did some, a few basic, made a few phone calls to people, uh, you know, just to get uh, some feedback about this company's reputation. And it was all bad. And so um, I mentioned this to Andy. I said, look, I, I, you know, we all know that record companies are bad. They're wicked people and that they don't treat their artists well. But these guys, he said, well, you know, I'm signed. They, this is the only offer we've got. I'm taking it. I said, well, I'm not signing. I've, I, you know, I've had enough bollocks with, you know, dealing with Virgin and, and their accounts department. It's just, you know, I, I no, I'm just not doing. I'm, I can't do it. So you're on your own. I'm, I'm gonna. There's nothing here for me now. Mm. I'm not gonna. I've not been paid for the work that I've done so far. Because don't forget, I'd actually contributed quite a lot of my time and effort into getting the songs into the shape they were. I'd done some basic string arrangements that uh, weren't used in the end because we didn't have the money at the time to, to do them, to, to actually record them. Uh, and it, that was, yes, that's right. We, it was just a whole heap of bad stuff. Yeah. You might want to edit this little bit because I'm rambling now. I'm getting yeah, that's, that's fine. About it's fine. I've wiped it from my memory because it's just too horrible to think about. Yeah. But basically I had to walk. And um, I don't think to this day Andy will ever forgive me for walking out on his project. Mm. Uh, it would have been better as his project if he just said, right, I'm going to do a solo album now. I'm cherry picking this material. I'll do Apple Venus Volume 1, the, in the orchestral album I've always wanted to make. And then we'll do the band when I've done this. And I would have been perfectly happy with that. There was more than enough great material yeah. for both Andy and Cotlin to make a, a really worthwhile XTC record. Uh, but there was nothing in Apple Venus really for me to justify me even sticking around. So, so I had to go. So how, what, what, but what sort of position did that leave you in when, well, once you left? I mean, um, did you sort of have to go? Did you have to sort of get into work straight away? I mean, how did work? But how did you find work and stuff after that? Yeah, I'm trying to think what happened. Um, there were a number of people, you know, I was doing the odd session, people, yeah. I didn't have a huge amount of money, but because we had actually, um, well, we'd done a number of audits, uh, the, we'd got rid of the management, we'd done a few audits of the record company, so there was some money there. There was enough money in the XTC pot from the Virgin record side of things. I, had, I was entitled to a share of that. And that was enough to tide me over for a, a year or two. So I wasn't desperate for money. And at the same time, I was getting offers of work, odd bits of session work. And that was the, uh, another odd thing that I've noticed right throughout the times, even the, the bleakest financial times of XTC, right at the point where I could see the bottom of the money barrel, 
a phone call would come and someone would offer me some work for a, for a month or two or a, a couple of sessions, whatever it was, it was enough to just keep me going for a couple more months. Uh, it was just sheer luck, really. And um, so that was basically how, how it turned out. You know, the, the money that I got from from after after we after I walked out of the band, it was then decided that you know a whole review of the financial situation with the band and me in particular uh, would have to be looked at again. And um, as a result of that, Terry Ch- they agreed to pay Terry Chambers, the drummer, for the work that he'd done prior to him leaving. And we got everything kind of straightened out on a more equitable basis rather than Andy squandering all the money mm, on recording great. costs. On recording. I mean, and you can see why he'd do that. You know, he's, he's a creative guy and, uh, you know, booking studios, that's the biggest drain of the money is the studio costs, mm. always. Um, they decided to take them, their share of the money and build a studio at Connie Moulding's house. Uh, which became part of the Idea Records setup. So Colin, the, the, for the Wasp Star album, which, which I had nothing to do with, which is the record they made after I quit, was recorded mostly at Colin's house with money right. that, uh, that they'd equipped this outbuilding that he had into a studio. It's a nice little place. Um, and they, that's, that's how the, uh, the Wasp Star album was made. This all kind of speaks to the fact that you need some kind of parameters or someone to set parameters for you. Because if you, if someone who doesn't really understand financial responsibility and has a tendency to be more creative and just follow the muse is put in charge of the bank account, they're just going to spend it all. You need it. You need some kind of higher power saying, okay, well, you can spend this much. And that's a bad decision, so you're not doing that. And so I guess at that, it, when there was no management oversight, it was Eager. just, yeah. It was at that point where management was crucial. Mm. And there was no management. Closest thing to management they had was me as honorary treasurer. Wow. <laughs> the, uh, Thankless. I, you know, exactly. <laughs> but... You know, I was able to, you know, everyone got paid. We used to have this annual meeting at the accountant's office around Christmas time to examine, you know, publishing money, how much of the publishing made this year, how much can we afford to pay ourselves for the following year. And, um, you know, that worked quite, you know, we were, everyone was quite happy about how that was working. Mm. And we weren't starving. Um, but we didn't have enough money to fund us, us uh, the recording costs for this huge project that Andy was planning. We had to get a record company deal. And they got a deal from, uh, 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 coming back to me now, a label called Pony Canyon in Japan bailed the band out. They paid for the mix of, uh, to finish the recording costs of uh, Apple Venus and part of the mix of... Um, of uh, of that record and then the rest of the money came from this american company who i won't name because mm. they might send a, someone around to beat me up. <laughs> <laughs> so they did go with, against your advice they went with that um that group company um for for some of the money yes and i i think i'm right in saying that uh, in fact i know for a fact that when andy um when Andy tried to decide, you know, he got, I, I gather he waited and waited for some, you know, accounts to appear on American sales of the record. And uh, when none were forthcoming, he then um, sent notice to them to say that he was going to audit them. <laughs> and that was like throwing a match into a, a dynamite store. So they didn't, um, so I don't think they were ever successful in uh, auditing the company and they certainly didn't get any more money it's a shame isn't it oh. it's a shame oh it's a terrible shame <laughs> so um, learn the lesson kids mm. yeah. you can't tell kids that though all they no. want is the they want to make records they want the attention they want to be adored yeah. that's the most important thing well the shine of that wears off very very quickly when it's when you depending on it for your livelihood 
uh, after a year or two, you start to, uh, mm, yeah, dear, larder's looking a bit sparse at the moment. Haven't we done a load of, haven't we sold any records? Yes, I think we sold quite a lot of records. Well, don't we get paid for those sales? Where's the, where is the money? Who's going to that go? But it doesn't, you know, the most important thing when you're starting out is to get out of your local hometown onto a big stage and uh, show everybody how big and fantastic you are. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a message. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what... Without that dream, you see, nothing would be achieved. You can't rubbish. Everybody has to start with a big dream. Otherwise, yes. nothing would be nothing would get worked on. No, I think that's but that that is key. I mean, you've got to you've got to have have that dream and 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 follow it through. Yes. I know, I mean, people were with you know not only music with whatever. I mean, I I know I was I was sat in a studio in Richmond with two two people that I hold in high, very high regard. When I was I was picking up some guitars to fix because I was literally I was sort of working out of a garage in Peterborough and I'd come down to London pick up loads of stuff from people I knew and then go back up fix it and then mm-hmm. yeah. and I said I've got you know I've got this idea I'm going to start making my own pickups and I want to build a build a little brand and do pickups pedals or whatever this kind of thing and they just looked at me like why the hell would you do that <laughs> <laughs> it's completely stupid don't do anything. It's, and the amount of times you 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 know you have to you have to be able to have that inner inner voice of just like just sod off. <laughs> just <laughs> I'm gonna do. I'm gonna give it a go. I want to try it. And yeah, if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. But you know. Yeah, but Matt, you know this is this is the whole thing about uh, this is what I say. If you want a job done, if you want a special job done properly, you have to find the man or woman with the passion, the need to do that work mm. you know all the others are just doing jobs find yeah. whoever it is who's got the dream the big the big dream and the passion and the interest the necessary you know because i'm sure that you spent all your spare time researching windings resistances going back through you know old schematics from the 40s and 50s learning how this stuff works and why it works and why certain other things don't work because you need it's something in there that's mm. that's drawing you to to that to that to the work that you're doing and that's why your work is so good <laughs> well, thank you very much <laughs> yeah that's a, that's a theme that's come up a lot isn't it passion for the thing that you're or being able to do the thing that you're passionate about and that if you can do that, then you will do it well. Yes. Um, but there's balancing, Dave, from what you've been saying, you need to balance that passion for doing the thing, whatever that thing is, with being practical about taking care of all of the boring side of things, like how am I going to buy new pants? Yes. Um, and my child needs food. So it's you can you've got to have the dream, but you've also got to have it grounded in some kind of day to day reality. Yeah, very much so. As long great. as you can pay, put food on the table, uh, you can keep yeah keep the dream alive. I mean, this is like I was saying, all the time I was working in that office job. The whole time I was just dreaming of, uh, you know, I couldn't wait to get home and put the records on. Mm. And, you know, that fed the dream playing that my record collection as soon as I got back from work it was just like this release it was like therapy and it fed the dream even though I realized you know that it was a remote possibility I couldn't let it go mm. and um, the closest I could do at the time I think it was, I was I was playing in a country and western band just to get work and to, to just learn about playing with other people on a stage and making music as a group even though I wasn't terribly um, in, uh, keen on the, the music we were playing, we were making music, and they were good guys, you know, we were friends. It was a good laugh. But yeah, yeah. again, it fed the dream, and I figured the more I do this, the better I'll get at it, and the better my chances are of um, maybe doing it professionally one day. And did you did the reality live up to the dream that you had when you were doing your day job? <laughs> no. 
<laughs> no, I that just, was the expected answer, to be honest. But go on, elaborate. <laughs> it was uh, actually working in the studio. Yes, in the studio, okay. that was that was the that was the crucible. That was the uh, yeah. That was that was my comfort zone. Always felt was that unexpected though, because everyone wants to say, "Look at me." Yeah, they probably. It, I don't know. I think it's um. The look at me aspect was fine for a while, but it was like you, you temper it with the, the the lack of sleep, the huddle together in a van, having to go out in all weathers um, around it. You know, oh, boy, we did this last night. Do we have to do it again tonight? Yes, you do. <laughs> well, I don't really want. Uh, oh, well, you know, but uh, you don't really um, when you're on stage. It's an easy thing to say. When you're on stage, you're not part of the audience, so you don't really get the get the the sense of it being an event as much as mm. you might do if you were, you know, down in the crowd. Um, and also that you know, I was never really. It, it's like the band doesn't sound as good on this stage as it did <laughs> in the studio. <laughs> but the studio was a great it was just a, you know you go in there and it's sort of it's everything's soundproofed it's all luxurious you've got this huge console you've got these two guys who know how to work that console uh, all you have to do is just play as the best you can play uh and trust that these guys are going to make you sound fabulous mm. uh, most of the time most of the time they did and if they didn't it was probably my fault anyway. But you get to learn, you know, it's just like um, the best on-the-job learning experience working in the studio, even though the, in the early days we only had two or three weeks in there at a time. It was, uh, you know, you treasured those, uh, those, uh, that, that time that you had. To, and, and um, you know, you, at the end of the day, of course, there's your record. There's your name on the record. You put it on the turntable. And that's your music, and that's uh, that's pretty special. Going going back to the touring quickly, can can you um, give us the worst ever moment that you experienced on tour? It, it may be on stage, or it may be just a big Barney on the M25, and someone gets out and starts walking down the hard shoulder, and like, anything <laughs> like that, just to give us an insight into how bad it can get and you it may be something you dealt with really well you know your amp may have been carried off by amazon tribe or something and you had to finish the gig with no amplifier you know the the spectrum is broad just something <laughs> a, a cataclysmic occurrence during touring that you kind of had to weather yeah well there were quite a few of those i can't imagine i'm trying to, uh, I'm trying to remember well from a, from a performance point of view i remember we were on tour in germany in 1979 uh we were playing in bavaria somewhere way way out in the sticks and uh, en route the van uh with the gear in it um uh drove into a storm and aqua planes and, and left the road and oh. so if, even though nobody was seriously injured uh the van was written off with all our equipment inside it and we oh. had a gig to play that evening mm. so we were thinking like well we either have to we we'd already got there you know we were in the, the minibus and we'd got to the venue uh but the gear hadn't and so it was a case well um Somebody had the harebrained idea of, uh, um, well, maybe there's, uh, yeah, that's right. Someone had offered to loan us some gear to do the gig. Let's get our drums here. We can get you some amplifiers. We haven't got any guitars yet, but we can probably find some. And so they they went out in the village and got us a back line. And yeah. so, we, yeah, we, and, the, and uh, we said, well, we've got, uh, let me see, the, the, it's the Peterson tuner is still in the van. Maybe we can tune the guitars. Uh and in the dressing room, there was a television set and there was somebody uh, doing a gig. It was a Spanish guitar recital. Oh, it's an E. Quick, let's do this guy. Uh, and we can go out there. And yeah, sure enough, that's what we did. And that's we went amazing. out on stage with uh, the, this, all these scrap bits of equipment. That's amazing. And we did uh, an hour set. I don't know how we got through it, but we did. And it went down all right. There weren't that many people there. It was only a couple of hundred people in the, in the crowd, in the in the audience crowd. 
Um, did any of them own the equipment that you were playing? I think yes, I think they did. I think uh, I think a number of them. Quite were, magical for them. <laughs> yeah, they, they might have appreciated it. But that was uh, that tested our metal. But as I say, we got through it. Um, fortunately, as I say, the van was recovered and repaired or replaced, and nobody was seriously injured. But it was scary, you know. That was a scary. Um, another time, we were on stage in um, we were on tour in Canada, which was in 1980. <clears throat> I think we were supporting the police. Yes, it had been one of the gigs we did supporting the police in a place called Regina in Saskatchewan. Mm. And he had gone down with food poisoning. He couldn't perform. So somebody said, well, um, Colin's got a bunch of songs. Why don't we go out there as a three piece and do um, just Colin songs? We thought, yeah, why not? We could do it. It'll only take maybe 40 minutes, but that's enough for a warm up set. Um, this is this is taking on Jazz Odyssey proportions from Spinal Tap. <laughs> you can't do Jazz Odyssey in front of a festival crowd. <laughs> <laughs> it was close to that. Well, so off we, we thought, yeah, well, Johnny, Johnny, well, I'll try and cover my parts and Andy's parts. It's going to be difficult, but we can, as long as Colin's in good voice, he can sing his songs. Amazing. We can probably yeah. get away with it. So um, we walked on stage and uh, I started... Uh, hit, yeah, Regina, we're going to give you a set of Colin Moulding songs. Um, off we go then. What's the first one? I, might, I can't remember what the first song was. It's either Night or Life Begins to Hop, something like that. Hit the guitar, the down chord, nothing happened. Nothing. I turned around. I've forgotten to switch my bloody amplifier on. <laughs> <laughs> That's how unprepared we were. Anyway, the amp came on. It warmed up. OK, we'll try that again then. So we started playing and suddenly the sound just disappeared again. Oh, no. And what happened? I trodden on my guitar lead and tugged it out of the guitar. So <laughs> oh, no. I'm left there again with a dead guitar and the cable on the floor. There. How many more things could go wrong? So anyway, we just we did actually finish a set after a while and we got sympathetic applause for it, you know, and it was like, oh, well, what a bunch of troopers. <laughs> Next. Oh. So that was a disaster. But uh, then the, the, the other thing, the other one that I remember was on the same tour, towards the end of the tour, Andy had a bit of a breakdown. We were driving from Toronto to New York in a heavy snowstorm in this minibus and... Uh, it was really, really bleak out there, you know, and it was just and suddenly he started um, sobbing. And I don't really want to go into too many details because it's not mm. a good memory for, for him. And it's not really anybody else's business. But he, uh, we had to stop the van and let him walk around and, and get him back on his feet because he was really, he just broke down. And um, that was not pleasant. And I just remember thinking, oh, dear, the sooner this tour is over, we get him home sooner he'll be repaired and ready to go out and do some more but uh, yeah that was a nasty one it's not a good portent being a long way from home it's it's like that kaiser chief lyric isn't it i've never been so far away from home sometimes physically and emotionally you just feel like you're in a different universe to home and it feels like it's impossible to get back there mm -hmm. and then you're you know all of the walls come tumbling down and and I think anyone who's been on tour has probably experienced that. And when you're not in your in your own country, you know, the, where you live, it's it's exacerbated mm -hmm. because it's there's water between you and and the place that you call home. So, yeah, I, I'm sure most people have been in a tour bus and felt like crying or probably have actually cried <laughs> because it's just it's and. You know, the, t the tour life is so emotional, isn't it? It's so that performance is so intense and there's so much probably cortisol and adrenaline mm. dumped into your system. And then you come off and you can't go to sleep and you've got to do all the traveling and you're with the same people all the time. And like you say, the repetitiveness of firstly playing the stuff, but having to put on a show, all of that is just a powder keg of yeah stuff waiting to waiting to be lit and it affected andy more than it did the rest of us you know because of course he's the one that everyone comes to see he's mm. the font of all the all the or most of the creative create the all the creative energy came from him mm. 
And so he felt the pressure the most. And he was the one that, uh, out of all of us, didn't want to be there. Uh, yeah. <sighs> we, we can't, no, we can't leave on that. That's such a downer. We, get, we do this every <laughs> single time. We get we, we need to place that plane question. Into the, <laughs> we need to place that, uh, place that question somewhere different. I think. Yeah. <laughs> yes, that's right. Yeah, we crash yeah. the plane into the concrete at the end of every single podcast. It seems. <laughs> It, well, it, that's the story of uh, that is the story of the, the professional musician, I suppose. Um, it, it, it's it very, very rarely is a happy ending, mm. uh, unless you are, you know, a superstar who's super minted and has homes in every uh, on every continent. There's a few of those. They've they've reached the top of the tree, but for most of us, um, I mean, I can't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't change anything. To be honest with you, I've had a brilliant life. And there's still a bit more of it left, which I have to make the most of. Uh, I've been so lucky because um, I haven't had to go out and work in a horrible job for somebody else mm. for, for rotten wages, not for not for 40 years. And so I'm very, very grateful for that. You've been able to work for yourself for rotten wages instead. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> That's more palatable. Oh, and it's yeah. that, makes a bit, uh, that makes all the difference, it believe does. me. It does, yeah. <laughs> and what what are you on now? Just to try and drag the nose of the plane out of the concrete a little bit. Yeah. What uh, what are you up to at the moment? Uh, well, in March this year, I because you know we're in the middle of this COVID nineteen lockdown situation, so I've been using this time to reconfigure my music room. As I mentioned earlier, I've mm -hmm. uh, I have to get rid of the old um, worn out desk and replace it with something that works and uh, I'm going to try and finish off some music of my own uh, this I just odds and ends of stuff uh, I've actually been able to I've actually started writing uh, proper songs in the last few months as a result of having a lot of free time because yeah. having left big big train um, I've realized exactly how much time I've invested in that group over the last uh, eight or nine years. And now I find myself with a lot of free time where I can actually finally start working on my own stuff and doing what I want to do instead of, um, I mean, you know, I, I really loved the work that I did with that group. And uh, that was the reason I was happy to put all that time into it. Um, you know, we, we, we all got paid, but it, we didn't get paid by the hour. Mm. I certainly didn't get paid by the note <laughs> but, uh, and it was, it's a great uh, really really fabulous uh, musical project uh, I'm sorry to have had to leave it but um, their tour plans were not uh, to my liking so uh, it's best that I go now while COVID-19 is uh, upon us and nobody's working mm. I think it's time they could uh, it's time for, for, for a change of a change of attitude and um, do something new and different and not as pressured and uh, and and something that's going to give me some pleasure now. That's and good. So, and are we are we going to hear any of these at some point? Is that the intention or is it I'm you just want to finish it? But what I'd love to do, I want to make a proper vinyl only album. Just mm. uh, probably, you know, there might be 500 people out there who'd be interested in hearing it. I'm sure. Uh, uh, that's probably what I what, what my immediate plans are, and then we'll see what the reaction is to that. Assuming I finish it, <laughs> and uh, because you know who knows what's around the corner, I might get another tempting offer from some other talented uh, bunch of songwriters and artists who like to hear me play on their record and maybe tour with them. Uh, who knows? Right. But uh, for the time being. I'm relaxing. I'm semi-retired. I don't have to worry about money. I've got a state pension coming in. I've got some savings. And so I'm going to enjoy life for, for the next year or two and see see what happens. Just see what happens. Sounds good. So the door is still open for any people who want to pay you a million pounds to go and write songs with them. Yeah, that's a million pounds would do it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. You heard it here, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. And on that bombshell, on that um, bombshell. is the time to call it a day. 
Yes, but, Dave, right. thanks so I'm much. I'm sure that uh, I'll be in touch with you again, I'm sure, at some point in the future with uh, another problem for you to solve. I'll, I'm <laughs> happy to do it. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dave. That was wonderful. And thank you for being so open and honest with us about everything that uh, went on in your musical journey. Well, thank you. And it's been a pleasure. And, um, you know, it's now it's probably, you know, appropriate to look back and uh, and reassess exactly what I've done, because at the time, you know, the, the XTC thing, as I said to somebody recently, it was the most important thing in all of our lives. It probably mm. took precedent over over family in some cases Mm. um it just became you know a whole focus was what are we going to do next what's happening next is this record going to be better than the last one we've got to make sure it is um it was our lives and um now it's time to sort of uh, perhaps decompress and look back and see well was it all worth it yes i think it probably was i think it probably was worth it well, it was worth the sacrifice it was worth struggling with no money for those few those desperate 80s years um but it all came through in the end and um i think we're all the better for it and now there's any number of tribute acts out there keeping the flame burning god bless them they're doing a great job and God knows, you know, the records are still selling. People are still discovering the band and, and buying the stuff. So thank you very much to all of those who are, who are throwing their money at us. It's brilliant. Great stuff. Thanks, Dave. I hope to see you in person at some point. I'm sure it'll happen at some point, indeed. Yeah, definitely. Right. Cheers, Dave. Nice speaking to you. you all too. the best, yeah. fellas. See ya. Bye. Cheerio.